Hi, I'm Lee Ehrenberg, and I'd like to welcome you to another event of The Living Room. The following program was recorded at the Santa Monica Public Library and is brought to you in collaboration between the library, the Friends of the Library, City TV, and the California State Library. Now sit back and enjoy. Tonight, we are gifted with two remarkable forward-thinking women who can be, at once, competitive but friendly colleagues, both with immense insight and integrity, caring for our growing senior population in the home. Esty Bienstock is a registered nurse educated at LAC USC. Bunny Dibnis has her many degrees from UCLA and additionally Cal State Northridge. We have a Trojan and a Bruin in the same room on the same stage, and there will be no cross-town ta rivalry this evening, because these two women serve a purpose here tonight, but more importantly, out in the big, wide world of senior care. Esty and her partner in life and business, Amir, are the owners of All Point Home Health, providing both private care and skilled care by their team of highly trained professionals. Esty oversees it all, her finger on the pulse of every client. She is so integrally involved in their overall care, including the well-being of their morale, that she bakes holiday cookies for them and personally, thank you, delivers to their homes. She is a recog... I am short, aren't I? She is a recognized face and voice on the speaker circuit, she sharing her knowledge unselfishly with all. And among her many community positions, she has served as vice president of the Rehab Nurses Society and has been a long-term member of the USC Educare Coalition. With warmth and humor and quintessential professionalism, Bunny Dimness is the Director of Professional Services for Live Home, a multi-city home care company that has grown exponentially to cities across the country. This company is built on a care management model, offering yet another layer of care and comp competence to their clientele. Bunny brought her depth of experience to Live Home at its inception and has been integral in its rapid growth. She is a recognized speaker nationwide, often a presenter at national conferences and associations, and an educated authority on a vast number of subjects involving senior care. You have the bios in front of you. I recommend highly that you read them and learn more about these fantastic women. I am priv privileged to know both of them in two capacities, as trusted and respected colleagues and as warm and very caring friends. So now you glean from their knowledge. I'm introducing Bunny Dibnis and following her, Esty Bienstock. Bunny, you're on. Well, I appreciate you all coming out. I missed the deep end. I don't know. I'm not big on the Olympics, but thanks very much for coming. In the spirit of Rosalind Carter, I have a question for you. How many of you are currently caregivers? And here, here. And how many assume you will soon be caregivers? And how many of you at one time think you will need a caregiver? And how many of you are, think you're immune because you're a professional in the community? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll give you my card. <laughs> uh, Truthfully, it really affects us all, and that's why I'm here. Today, I have a very short period of time to talk about a very big subject, so I'm really, rather than give you every resource that's available in the community, of which I am quite sure if you came out on a Thursday night and we had time, you could tell me, I'm really going to tell you some of the secrets that we use in really looking deeper and, and not only finding the resources, but finding the right resources and making sure we're using them for the right reasons. So. With that, I'm going to look. You know, again, there are so many options, the good news and the bad news. In about the 20 years plus that I've been involved in the aging community, I have seen a tremendous growth. Somehow somebody looked and said, the boomers are coming. 
And now guess what? The, next, the first boomers will turn 65 January 1st. The truth is uh, that really isn't the issue. The issue is 20 years from now when those boomers turn 85 years old. So a lot of the boomers, and I assume most, uh, many of you out there are, you're dealing with your own caregiving issues and looking forward to what's gonna be ahead for you that time that at some point that you will need it. So that's my perspective on this. And again, it all seems really easy, the tip of the iceberg. I get the calls every day like many of you out there, tell me what the best home is or who's the best doctor or my mom, in our case, you know, she wants to stay home and she's an 80-year-old and has a stroke. Can you take care of her? And I hear about, you know, she lives in the Hollywood Hills and she's been divorced three times. And I'll say, tell me some more about your mom. And it's a little more difficult. Well, I didn't tell you about the alcoholism and the 17 cats she has living in her home and the dysfunction in our family that my rehab brother goes in and out of her home and all the complications that come with living for 65 or 75 or 85 years. So, so bear that in mind. I, you know, I'm a psychotherapist by training, so I love all this family drama and all these kinds of things. But when you're dealing with it, and I have to deal with it, unfortunately, in my own family, it's not quite as interesting and it, beco it becomes a real challenge. So what happens with this aging network? The truth is it's extremely fragmented. The problem is, and I get it every day, you know one person that knows about aging and they think they're, they may be an expert because they took care of their mom and they did a great job or they had a wonderful experience in a facility or they had one independent caregiver that worked wonders and now they can tell you, they wanna tell you exactly what's right for your particular situation. Even more frustrating, we've got a system that's in silos. We've got a, turn, a legal financial group that really doesn't know the medical. We've got a medical group, we've got doctors that know if any of you have been in the hospital or spoken to most physicians. They know about, they know about nursing homes, they know about nurses, they know about hospitals. But this long-term care, this, this, this series in the, in the library, they don't have a clue what's out there. So we've got, it's very, very hard as a consumer to come in there, think you're talking to an expert by, you know, we, I remember the programs of Marcus Welby and he could tell you not only about medicine, but he knew the stock market, he knew the two good homes in the community, and he knew the best lawyer in town. Unfortunately, it's not like that anymore. There are multiple, multiple providers. Um, for us, we have in-home services. There are many people, Esty does a wonderful job, and there are 300 others that have similar, but not exactly the same kind of services. In addition, we have many, many people doing many kinds of assessments. We get it all the time. They said, I was assessed, I don't need your assessment. I was assessed by a physical therapist or a neurologist or my Medicare social worker or my discharge planner or my placement person. Why would I need yet again another assessment? So you have to understand our system is confusing, confusing. For, for people that are in the system and think they're elder care experts, it's confusing. Um, again, there's a proprietariness about the, the information. There is a non, the, the bias of, and as a for-profit organization I can, who has worked in nonprofits, there is a bias of the nonprofits to ignore the for-profit world. And what that means now with dwindling resources, people have to scramble about to find out what else is out there be, besides the public benefits that were available maybe or maybe not in the, before this, the change in our economy happened. So these, these kind of things are very, very difficult for the caregiver. Um, and again, the payment structure is fragmented. If any of you were members, uh, are, were veterans and you know about getting medications in, in the VA, it, far outweighs, in, for the most part, the benefits you get from Medicare Part D. The problem is, if you like your doctors and your regular Medicare system, and those of you who are vets know, you have to go back to your primary care physician at the VA hospital, so they will pay for the medications or you get that reduced rate. So very, very confusing for a lot of people coming out there. So we have to identify resources. Just by a show of hands, and we don't have a lot of time for comments, how do people out there get your resources? You are all, again, most of you are caregivers out there. You came here, you found this. There's got to be ways. What do you use? By a show of hands, anybody? Where do you find your resources from? 
Doctors or nurses, okay, and that's a, a traditional way of getting them. The doctors give the information they give. Anybody else? Yes? Friends. Friends. Testimonials, that's a great way. It, it, it's a good way of getting personal experiences, and sometimes you can trust friends really more than the professionals that may play golf with them but, but ha have different experiences. Anybody else? Yes? A place for mom. A place for mom, so the Internet or... Or the, or the individual person on a place for mom has given you s some, some, some information on some of the information you need. Good. Anybody else? Come on, Paula. <laughs> the, local senior the local senior centers. Okay, that's a good one. Okay. And I think the first is we have to understand resources. The reality is 85% of people are doing the caregiving by themselves. So with all the hoopla and all the internets and all the senior centers and all the private businesses, the majority of people in this country are doing it themselves. So we have a lot of informal resources, number one, in family. We have it in friends and we have it in neighbors. And that was the real traditional, peop the real traditional way of getting care. And I think probably in smaller cities, it's probably way higher than 85%. How many of you are doing the heavy lifting in your caregiving without paid caregivers or a very small percent without? Okay, this is an anomaly. This is definitely not the 85% that we're looking at in the world, but that's it. The other is the semi-formal ones, and these can be the church groups, the faith-based organizations, the fraternal organizations, and a lot of times we forget there's some incredible volunteers out there, there's in, incredible programs out there. And then finally, the, we think of the formal services, and when we think of elder care, you know, kind of in my world, and a lot of us professionals out there, we look at the reimbursed services, I think we all look at our health care insurance, that certainly is the, the big ticket item for us, the nursing homes, the skilled care, the paid caregivers, the home care agencies, the modifications, on and on like that. Then there's the social service agency. Paula mentioned the, the senior centers, and all our communities have senior centers. We have various public agencies, uh, service agencies around the, around the community. Some are government-funded, and some are what we call non-government agencies. The Lisa's Place, some of you may be familiar with, and other support sites like that. And finally, the paid services that we talked about, the, the, the caregiving services, the assisted livings, the non-reimbursed nursing homes and independent living facilities and the like. So we have lots of resources out there. So when you talk about resources, I'm not sure in this crew what you had in mind when you came, but understand it's a big, big topic. So we start. There's lots of ways of getting them. One, of course, and I put it on top, is community forms. Um, you come to enough of these and you can become pretty, pretty good at knowing the lay of the land of a lot of the services, particularly for your community. I was speaking last week at um, uh, Burbank, Buena Vista Library, and Burbank is not unlike Santa Monica, and it's a good, solid community, and they have an incredible resource book and a senior center and all those kind of things. So community forms can be great. The internet sites, and um, I asked this question to a group of professionals, 90% of them, nobody mentioned all, anything you mentioned, it was all on the internet. They Google things, so it's getting more and more, and you can get those lists on the, you can get those lists. I can, I use the internet. It gives you lists is what it does, and it's almost too much information, but you can get some wonderful, wonderful information on the Internet. Again, the Area Agency on Aging, just so you know, through the Older American Act, for any of you, any of you long-distance caregivers that you have families out of town? Okay, through, through the, the Area Agency on Aging and the Older American Act, um, every, every city and county in this country is covered by... A, a, a senior center and senior services. They vary from city to city, but it's a great way to start when you start looking for resources, particularly for public services. Again, the disease-related organizations, Alzheimer's Association, stroke, cancer, those kinds of organizations. Personal recommendations somebody mentioned out there. I always like to hear what people's personal experience is. It's not the only thing you can listen to because, again, people tend to know what they know, but it certainly is a good way of a, a good starting point. Again, national and local nonprofit organizations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that those can be the professional organizations that folks like me belong to, and a lot of us that are in professions have national and local organizations. 
Um, and then our trusted professionals. And I think, again, it used to be Marcus Welby. It seems for me that people get to know their attorneys and financial planners now better than they do their physicians because they get paid by the hour, so they'll, they sit there for a good hour with them as opposed to the five minutes or ten minutes sometimes allotted in a medical appointment these days. So all different ways. Um, question comes in. Why should I pay for it when I get it for, when I can get it for free? And very interesting, when I started my career in aging, I ran a publicly funded case management program at Jewish Family Service. And we had great people. We had one of them sitting right there. We had a great staff. Everybody was master's level. And it was publicly funded. There were limitations. And then I was asked, when funding kind of shrunk, gee, will you, you also run the fee-for-service program? And I go, sure, you know, I'll be happy to do that. And I go, why would anybody pay for it if they could get it for free? I don't get it. And I never understood those people over there that people were stupid enough to be paying. Well, it became much bigger than that. And when you look at it, when that question arises for you, um, one of the things is you have to be eligible. So if you are met, the, we have a MSSP program for, for home-based people that, to keep them at a nursing home, and it's fabulous. The only problem for many people is you have to qualify for Medi-Cal to be on it. So you have to understand that many of them have income requirements. Others are by location. So you may want to be in a program in Santa Monica, but if you don't live in Santa Monica, you can't be in that program. Diagnosis, and again, some are based, some of you are familiar with regional center for some of the younger disabled. Well, you have to have the diagnosis, the mental, mental illnesses, and the same. So um, aging, I guess, is one of those diagnoses. I don't know, but you have to be 62 for most of the programs through the Area Agency on Aging. Again, and then there's the need. So for some, you have to be dependent on certain activities of daily living and certain other criteria. So that's the basics. So even if you say, I don't want to pay for anything, you have to be eligible, number one. Then it depends. You may be eligible, but it may not be available. They say, boy, I, I qualify for the city program, and that's great. And I heard it's terrific, and those social workers are great. But there's a six months ma waiting list. Um, if any of you have tried to get HUD housing in the um, last, I don't know, 15 years that I've been around, it, it, in theory, it's a great system, but try to get those, those HUD housing. So it has to be available. There might be urgency. So again, if you, need, if you need something urgent and you need an assessment, if you need somebody to come out the next day, it probably is not going to be in one of the very, very few of the programs are going to allow you to have those kind of things. So you can't call your shots in the same way. Um, it has to fit your need. If you're an out-of-town family member and you need somebody to be, in your, be monitoring your mother every week or or those kind of things, or be available 24-7, so if they need them, um, that's not what the public programs are about. You know, it's an appropriate, it, it's as best as it can do with a limited amount of resources, so you have to understand that. Um, really, really important, and a, a lot of the frustration comes, and I see it when people go into nursing homes, is uh, they have unrealistic expectations of what to expect. So they go into a nursing home, mom is demented, and she had a stroke, and she wanders, and they're furious, and she refuses to eat because she's not hungry, and it you know it takes them an hour of prompting, and the expectation is that the nursing home is gonna take care of this. Well, the, the state says the nursing homes have to have 2.7 hours a day of care per person in a nursing home. It's just not realistic to expect that they're gonna have one-on-one -on -one care. So we have, to have the, we have to have realistic expectations, whatever program it is. Some of the, pro again, not, and I was part of an incredibly good case management program, but when you have 60 people on your caseload, you simply can't give that one-on-one -on -one attention that you may wanna give. Really important to know that. Um, there might be a better options available, and again, that you may say that well, that's fine, and I can, get a great, I can get a great assessment, but I want it much more than that. So there are other options that can really, I'd like, a, I'd like somebody you know, with whatever, I want a nursing background, and there's only social workers in the senior center or whatnot. So we have to look at what options are available, and again, remember the limitations. And, and as things are shrinking, and if I haven't looked at the paper today, I don't know what shrank this time, but the adult day health cares are in jeopardy and the in-home supportive service are in jeopardy and who knows what's going to happen with our senior centers. So that's the reality that we don't even know yet. I'll be having a different conversation a year from now. Again, there's something. 
I'm getting, okay, I'm going through it. Okay, what we need is, one, it really is important to know what is available and what it means when you ask for senior resources. We have legal financial insurance, and this is one of these silos of folks that we really need to plan ahead for. I get the calls, and these are the difficult calls, that people haven't done their estate planning, or they had their, their son that's an attorney, but he's in a real estate attorney, and there's some very complex issues going on with the family. There are not powers of attorney for health care. There may be after death, and I've been involved in these probate cases, very, very complicated estate plans with blended families and lots of resources and families that have written children out of their wills and all these kind of things, and they haven't done the planning on the front end. On the other hand, there's some simple, simple wills that can take care of a lot of aggravation. So really important, there are specialists called the elder law attorneys that take care of the estates. They take care of the special needs trust if there's younger disabled around so you can protect public benefits. If it has to go to conservatorship because the, pers the, the older adult is in danger for their self and somebody has to make legal decisions, these are the folks that do it. It is the specialist in elder law. Trust me, when, particularly some of these contested problems, you start getting people out there. They may have the license. You may have a license to practice medicine, but that doesn't make you a cardiologist. And the same as you may have a license to practice law, but it doesn't make you an elder law attorney. Um, again, the financial planners, it is too late to plan it generally when you need the long-term care. This starts now. This starts, you know, they tell 20-year-olds now, start putting your money away to start saving for, for later on. So financial planning, there are people now that, uh, that I've actually used for several people that people don't know how much they can afford to spend. They don't know if they can afford to have their mom or dad or spouse stay home, or they don't know what kind of an assisted living they may get. So there are, there are people out there that can help you and look at budgets and look at what you have and look to make sure if long-term care insurance is, is the appropriate kind of, uh, the kind of uh, tool that may help you do what you wanna do. Really, really important. Again, there are accountants. You need accountants if you have a good accountant that knows you and knows you personally and they start seeing things. Many of the good long-term family accountants, all of a sudden somebody that's been very meticulous with their taxes, one year they don't come in, they miss appointments, or things are very, very in a lot of disorder, or there's irregularity in the savings accounts. These are the people that can have a red light and know what's going on and help, help, help people as they start losing capacity. Again, there's money managers, and these are one of, the, one of the kinds of things, and there are probably about five things, and I'll throw it in now because my time is extremely short and I want to get it in for those of you who are caregivers. Where you should really be concerned, there's lots of things to be concerned, there's lots of worries, and some are urgent and some are not so much. So what we look at is five different basic issues that we look at that we have to take care of to know somebody safe in their home or in an independent living or what, they, what, they, what kind of help they need. And one is to make sure that they are man the first one is basic is the driving and that one is it, we look at it and and there's all kinds of issues with that but it's the driving it's the financial money management when people stop paying their taxes stop paying their insurance um, paying somebody too much all these kinds of issues so it's the driving the money management the medications, 60% of people that come out of the hospital, and this is out of the hospital, are not taking the proper medication when they get home. This is a whole day issue, but no, it's a problem. And it's, people die from this problem when they're back in the hospital and spending millions and millions and billions of dollars because of this. So medication is an issue. And it's not enough for somebody to be able to tell you, yes, they know that they're taking these medications. It really takes looking and making sure that they're taking what they should supposed to be taking the doses they can. So those kind of, those are three big ones. The other is eating and and older adults, many older adults, your taste buds change and you're not so hungry and if you don't feel well. So malnutrition's a big problem. Wanting to save money and eating food that's spoiled, that's a big problem. Not drinking, again, thirst changes as you get old. So people are not drinking enough fluids and then we get that dehydration and people fall and break their hip and on it goes. So and then there's safety in the house. Ten minutes, okay, we'll go fast, we'll go fast. Again, um, so those are kind of issues that we deal with. Again, the insurance, the long-term care. The only thing I will tell you quickly is 
when you ha come down with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or a stroke, that is not the time to buy long-term care insurance. It really is not a yes or no. It's an individual, and if anybody wants to talk more about it, I'm happy to answer those questions later. Um, Medigap and Medicare, as we know, at 65 or for certain other people disabled, that's this, the health insurance for the elderly. Um, if you've worked a certain amount of quarters, 40 quarters in this, in this in this country, and there's lots of other criteria for Medicare if you want to know more about that. And I'm going to tell you real fast because they're great and they have great for handouts. Center for Healthcare Rights can give you, um, and high cap programs at a lot of senior centers, wonderful handouts that'll explain everything those programs covered. So you make the decision whether you're going to be on Medicare with a, Medi uh, with a Medigap policy to cover the balance or you're going to go on to an HMO or you qualify for Medi-Cal, Medi which can actually become your, sec your secondary policy with Medicare. So lots of information to find out. Again, I'm, what I'm doing in this half hour or, or less, I guess, is, is giving you what you need to know and I can, you know, it's pretty easy to find and, and I can give you those questions how to get to it later. Um, the entitlement programs, and these are the programs. Um, I have them listed here, but what I'm going to tell you very, very quickly, if you call, if, if you use the internet, everybody out there can use the internet. If you go into benefitscheckup.org, benefits with an S, checkup.org, put in a little bit of information, take you five minutes, you will get every public benefit at wherever you are in this country. And what it'll do, so say you qualify for meals, it'll link you to the Meals on Wheels program in your community. That, millions of people have used this. It's, it's a tremendous thing. And of course, you can get the, this information from senior centers and, and the area agency on aging and information and referrals and elder links and on and on and on. But it's a great starting point for anybody, only public services. Again, you're not going to get your elder law attorneys. You're not going to get your private care managers and the like, but, but it's a great service. Again, there's, pub, uh, there's public services, and most of these are um, not necessarily means tested, but they're safety nets. I have a, in the, in the back, and because I knew I wasn't gonna have time to talk about, there is a continuum. People wait for emergencies, that's just human nature. I know a lot of you are out here, and we get the calls when there's a crisis. This is a continuum of who to call in a crisis. So, um, I'm involved in this elder mediation, and we put together this little continuum, but it talks about all the different, anywhere from clear and present danger, you call 911. You forget about all the fancy services and resources, and you call 911, all the way down to Adult Protective Service and the Ombudsman and public case management programs, private programs. There are public and private in almost everything, and I put this in color because you'll see I put the private in red and the public in in the black, so I guess the private puts you in the red, and I don't know why I did that. There was a reason, but it's out there, and if I don't have enough, give me your card and I'll get this, and it has some really good numbers to look at. Again, there's medical, and the only thing I'm gonna say about this is there are specialists in geriatrics. Unfortunately, there are not, we have a vast shortage, but there is a very big difference when somebody has studied geriatric medicine. It's an next subspecialty over their initial training. So medications are very, very different in older adults. We're very fortunate in Los Angeles. We've got some centers of excellence that have multidisciplinary teams. So you go to one place and you get the geriatrician and the neurologist and the social worker and the blood test and the psychiatrist. UCLA has one, Olympia Medical Center, Sage Sherman Oaks Hospital has one, USC has them, and there's a lot of them around the community and around the country. Private practitioners that practice geriatric medicine, not so many. It's just, it's a, it's a very time intensive profession, so the reimbursement is so low. Same as geriatric psychiatrists, they're around, um, most of them have opted out of Medicare, so you're paying private for those. Or again, there are some, now I told a couple people, and if you work at Kaiser, you don't love it, but there's, there's a wonderful senior services that have great professionals. You just really have to be an advocate on Kaiser Sunset, five minutes, okay. Mental health services, what, just a comment on that, adjustment to aging and caregiving is huge. One in two spousal caregivers 
over 65 will die before the person they're taking care of. It's tremendously, tremendously stressful. It is normal, and that's why there are support groups there for it. Sometimes there are abnormal things in their psychiatric system. So we have a tra trajectory of mental health services all the way to locked units from peer counseling that's right here at Y Senior Services. Um, again, aging in place, lots of community services. Some are there to enhance and make life nice for some of my young retiree friends that take advantage of all the city services, and that's fabulous, and somebody, some people need a little more project, protective environment to do just what they like to do, and those are daycare programs around the community. There are classes galore, there's exercises, and again, some enhance and some protect. So really important to know the difference and get in the right ones. Um, again, um, in-home support, Esty is going to be speaking in detail or as much detail as she can in a half an hour about some of the differences of home care because there are many differences. It, all of them have two arms, two legs, and a head, and, and in some ways that's about as similar as some of the, home care, the different home care providers can be. Lots of different home care. We like to say we set up a virtual assisted living in the home because it's not just about getting that care provider. It's making sure you can manage that and oversee that and making sure your house is safe and, and you have all that you need in there. There's a medication management program and there may be some other people in there too. So know that if, you, if for those of you who have looked at assisted livings, you can pretty much mimic that in the home. Where it becomes tricky and prohibitive is the nursing home because that's overseen by a skilled provider, an RN. You get that in the home, and it's, it's way different costs involved and, and way different skill levels at all. So for assisted living, you can pretty much, there's more and more in the home. Everybody comes to the home now, including dog walkers. Um, again, alternative housing. Levels of care, really important. Time after time I get the calls and people look at the prettiest building or where they want to be and they don't, they don't take into account their mom or dad may have dementia. They may not want the fanciest place in the city. That may not be the way they've lived. Um, there are now niche markets for different people of different backgrounds, all kinds of levels of care. It is imperative you know the difference. And this is one of those places where I see the mistakes of people listening because their friend's mother it worked out for. They, don't, they didn't know that their friend mother, and of course they can go to this independent living because they're independent and they can play bridge and go on trips. But when mom is sitting in a bed and her world is much smaller, that may not be the place. Really important to understand the difference and know it and, and really put in in the front end to investigate that. Caregiver support, I'm going to, uh, lots and lots of caregiver support. Anything that we're doing on the other end, we're going to parallel with caregivers. Really important, those caregivers, you end up become the person being cared for if you don't watch out. And I'm not going to say too much about that. Lots and lots, it's equally as important. This aging business is a family affair. It's not just the older adults, it's the frailest, because that can change one stroke, one telephone call, one slip, and it can change the whole what's going on. So really important to take care of yourselves out there. Um, families have time limitations. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the time. They don't have the resources. There's crazy family dynamics going on. And probably most importantly, it is extraordinarily hard to be objective about a family member when you're taking care of them. That's where folks like me and my profession come in. We have Geriatric care managers and, and city case managers, these are folks, nurses, social workers, psychotherapists that come out there, do the evaluations, set up a plan, look at the picture. We have seen the beginnings, the middles, and the ending of this, and in many cases, oversee the case until the, either the death or, or people get better and take care of that. So they can be your partners in this. Um, really, really important, particularly if you're from out of state or you're working full time, or you're simply overwhelmed, or you don't get along with the person that you're taking care of. So this is a profession that's grown in the last 20 years. Again, there's a city component of it that mimics it with the same assessment, care plan, coordination of services, monitoring, and oversight, and then, and then um, exit plan, just a little bit different in the way it's done. So really important to know about those. Again, 
It's the understanding, the planning, and the managing. So going discharge from a hospital, getting a list from a discharge planner is really not getting resources. It's getting a list from a discharge planner. Um, and finally, and we are stopping, okay? Pretty good, huh? Um, again, most importantly, explore the values and preferences. Decide what is most important. If the most important thing is to be in the home, or the most important thing for many is to be near family, then it does not make sense, like the call I got yesterday, to move mom up to the Canagetbury in Rancho Palos Verdes when the daughter lives in Mar Vista because her mother thought it was pretty. There is probably better options, and we have one sitting back here for this mom. But her friend's mother liked it, and that's what she got. So really important, family for, for many is the most important things. Pretty environment for some is important. The skill level is some is important. Being around Jewish people or Catholic people, there's a new Japanese home I just read about. That may be the most important. So you have to look. Remember, values don't change. Those are the kinds of things that are important. If family is important, if religion is important, if food is important, that's not going to change. Preferences, if you have a blue room or a pink room, or if you're on Olympic Boulevard and you'd really rather be on Wilshire Boulevard, we can negotiate those kind of things. So really important to remember. Again, remember everybody, know your style. If you like to do all this and you really like the caregiving experience, don't give it up. If you like part of it, if you have a brother that likes paying bills, let him pay the bills and you spend the, the time with your mom sitting there for hours and hours or vice versa. Um, learn about the options available. You have to evaluate the financial realities. Again, don't wait till it's too late. Um, acknowledge your obstacles, consider alternatives, and then identify who can help you. You've got a room full of people. I think half the people in this room can help you in one way or another. And in closing, it, plays, it pays to plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built his ark. Hi, I'm Esty, and I'm uh, the owner of All Point Home Health, and I'm going to talk about some of the options that are out there for caregiving issues. Um, basically, I'm going to give you some clues as to how to figure out what it is that you need, because what's good for me or what I may need may be different than what Mrs. Jones needs for her family. So you have to be able to figure that out. How do you you know, assess your own situation. Do you get someone to come in and help you assess it? Have you been dealing with some of these issues and basically kind of know what it is that you need? So how do you basically figure that out? I'm going to give you some care options and, um, and then after I'm finished, Bunny and I will be able to answer some of your questions because there are different issues that are affecting all of you and it depends on what is affecting you that will make you decide what questions you need to ask. Um, basically, 20 to 25 percent of family members are involved in elder care and that's getting more and more. The baby boomers are getting older and what's happening is, is that realistically for myself, not one of my friends doesn't work. So that it's very different than when my mother had to help take care of my grandmother. My mother was available. She didn't have a full-time job. Whereas now, what is happening is, is that there is a thing called the sandwich generation where you have family members that are dealing with their aging parents, but are also dealing with teenage and college kids. And they are feeling like a piece of, you know, bologna in between two pieces of bread. And it's like everybody else gets taken care of except the person themselves. So it's very, very difficult. 80 to 85 percent of the people who are dealing with caregiving issues are dealing with them by themselves. Many times, I saw that there were a few hands that went up. What happens is, is that you're here and your loved one might be in Podunk, Iowa. And what happens is, is that you're very nervous. You can't pick yourself up and move to take care of all of their needs. But what happens is, is that you have to be able to figure out what are you going to do? How are you going to give them the help that they need? 
And what happens is, is that we're finding that a great deal of these, this 85% are elderly people taking care of their elderly loved ones. So it's not always that easy. It's not always the daughters or the sons that are having to deal with the care, but sometimes it's an 85-year-old taking care of an 82-year-old. And, you know, they don't always know, first of all, what to do, and physically and emotionally don't have the strength to do it. 75% of caregivers are women. And what you do is you find that a lot of times women are the ones that are helping make decisions and taking care of their parents as well as their husband's parents. So that they're the ones that are dealing with the majority of the caregiving issues. 50% of caregivers are working outside of the home. And what happens is, is that truthfully, I think that it's more than 50%. In our age group, in the 50s, in, your, in the late 40s to 60s, I think that there's many more people that are now working, unless they've lost their jobs, that, but, you know, in this economic situation, but there are more people than 50% that are really out in the working world as well as having to take care of their loved one. When you end up taking care of somebody, what happens is, is that your whole family dynamics changes. And what happens is, is that it it's like your everyday life becomes different than what it was. And by being able to ask for help, it allows you to be able to look at things much more clearly. I think that what happens is, is that both bon Bunny and I get the phone calls that are crisis because people just don't know what to do. And they wait a long time before they decide that they need to do something to be able to help them. I think that help, asking for assistance it can make a difference in the quality of life, not only for your loved one that needs the help, but also for the person who is the caregiver. Remember that it's all about quality of life. I think that, you know, the quantity, you know, it's great. All of us are living longer, and for a great majority of that time, we're living longer and healthier. But once you become ill and you need assistance, if one person is taking on the total responsibility, it becomes detrimental for that whole family unit. I think that you need to consider the difference, what your needs are, by knowing what the medical conditions are. Did something just happen right now that may make you need help? Oftentimes, someone falls down, breaks a leg, breaks a hip. They may need care for a short period of time. It may not be an ongoing situation. Is it a chronic illness? Is it dementia where it's becoming worse and worse and the person is no longer the person that you once knew and is, um, is becoming less and less able to take care of themselves and you're not able to see them as who they once were? Are they having balance and mobility problems, dexterity problems, and where they're not able to do for themselves? Are they not as strong as they used to be? And is the memory an issue? Is their activities of daily living being affected? That means that they need help with meal preparation, with bathing. They need help with, um, with eating um, they need help with their personal hygiene, going to the doctor, going shopping. What are the things? These are the things that you need to look at in your own individual situation. And you need to basically be able to write down what it is that you need for help with your loved one and what it is that your loved one needs in order to be able to maintain their daily routine. I think that what happens is, is that you need to figure out whether a person is depressed and may need to go and see a geriatrician, whether their, their physical well-being is, being, um, is diminishing. You want to find out what are the issues that are going on in your own individual situation. Because sometimes what happens is, is that a person is very depressed they're de they have dementia, they're not able to remember as well, but physically they're doing very, very well. So you may need 
a daycare center that may just give them a you know a daily routine that allows them activities that allows them to do different things or you may have a situation where your loved one is physically being challenged because they're no longer able to move around as well physically they're not uh, doing very well they have diabetes they have high blood pressure their daily routine is affected by their ability to be able to just function Safety issues are a big thing, and that is one of the main reasons I think that both Bunny and I get called oftentimes, is because now Mr. Jones finds out, realizes that his wife is falling. He can't be around her every minute of the day, but she's not able to function on a daily basis without falling, without tripping. They're, they need, we need to evaluate sometimes their home hazards whether or not there's too much furniture around, whether or not they have carpets that are, you know, across the room. You know, many of our, our clients love their Persian rugs, you know, and they're all beautiful and nice, but the reality is, is that if you're, you're no longer picking your feet up to walk and you're dragging your feet, you need to really consider that it's time to roll up those Persian beautiful rugs because the safety is an issue. When someone is in their 80s and they basically trip over and break a hip, the reality is, is that for them to recover and be the one person that they once were is not always very possible. So think about what it is that you need to do. Wandering. Is your loved one wandering? Oftentimes we get called in on cases where the person is perfectly okay during the daytime, but all of a sudden they, become, they get sundowners where they become very agitated, very stressed, very nervous at night. And what happens is, is that oftentimes Mr. Jones is great during the day, but at night he's keeping his family up all night long because they have to watch that he doesn't get out of the house. So you need to make decisions on whether or not we've had, where we've just not necessarily had to take care of Mr. Jones, but we basically suggested to put a special lock above where he could reach and he can't get out the door. Because oftentimes what happens is, is that the loved one, you know, Mr. Jones' wife will wake up and see that Mr. Jones is like, you know, six blocks away. So that you have to be able to figure that out. Driving is a major issue and for many of us, telling our loved ones that they no longer can drive is, is horrendous. But believe me, what happened in Santa Monica 10 years ago is not something that any of us want to deal with with our families. Believe me, when my father, was never a good driver. You know, he used to drive, <laughs> he used to bump into walls and he used to bump into poles and this was at his good day. But when his bad day, he ended up having like, I think five accidents in six months. And it was not terrible accidents, but you know, I kept thinking, God forbid he could just, you know, cross the street and kill himself or kill somebody else. And my whole family sat down with him and basically said, you no longer can drive. Whatever you need to get you from point A to point B, we will help you with, but you can no longer drive. And for many people, that, especially in Los Angeles, is very difficult because the majority of us have to, you know, I mean, driving is a big thing. Things are not that close together, but there are a lot of services a lot of services and a lot of ways where you can get transportation. And the thing is, is that if someone's not able to drive, they should not be on the road. Basically, you want to know whether or not there is a need for help if the person is physically and emotionally unable to take care of themselves. Uh, what happens is, is that over time, a lot of, uh, over time, I think a family member becomes very tired and very unable to supervise their loved one and sometimes will need additional care. And I'll give you some different ways of that care coming because it can be from home health, it can be from an assisted living, it can be from, um, from an adult day care center. There are so many ways that you can have so that your loved one is cared for. You need to determine what your needs are. Many times what happens is, is that if you don't allow 
someone like, you know, Bunny or myself to come into your, comp into your home and kind of evaluate what your day is like. What is the needs? What happens is, is that you might have to plan that out yourself. If you're all over the board and not know and can't be clear on what your needs are, it's sometimes difficult to really be able to make a decision on how to move forward. You want to be able to discuss these options with the people who are involved in the care of your loved one. Oftentimes, there's a good family unit where you might have the, you know, your, you might have your, you know, yourself, your husband, your kids, that may be helping the grandmother or the grandfather, having a schedule where there's someone there a few times a week to make sure that things are going well. You just have to kind of be able to discuss how are you going to move forward to make sure that your loved one is as safe as they can be. There are many different options. There is home health. I'm going to discuss what the difference is between home health, home care, because there is a big difference what it is to be in an adult day care center, an assisted living, and then at the end of life where you have to make decisions of, about your loved one's end of life um, choices, the possibility of uh, choosing a hospice. Skilled care would be home health. Skilled care would be the services that you would get, such as nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a social worker. These are done with visits. The visits are usually anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half, depending on what needs to be done. Sometimes the evaluation is longer than the visits. This is done when, um, for instance, a person has a stroke or has been hospitalized, they're on new medications. The nurse would basically make sure that the family unit or the client, the patient themselves, know how to use their medications. Are they using it appropriately? They then may come and they check a few times to make sure that the medication is working. If they're on new high blood pressure medications or diabetes medications, is, you know, is, is the medication working and is there a stability to the numbers that they are looking for in that? If a person has had a stroke and, or they have had diminished physical capacity, the physical therapist will help with strengthening exercises, with being able to make sure that the person can go up and down the stairs if they have that at home, any type of services that are skilled. That is a service that is paid by Medicare. Or if some of you have an insurance such as, um, uh, such as um, an HMO that is attached to your Medicare, they will cover also those visits. That is ordered by your doctor. Then there is the home care services. Home care services are more the custodial care. That is the assistance with activities of daily living, such as meal preparation, bathing, personal hygiene, going to shopping, doing an exercise program on a daily basis, if that's how you have it. That is a service that is paid out of pocket which means that you either have to pay by yourself if you have long-term care insurance, it will assist in paying. And when you deal with a home health agency, make sure that they will be able to bill your long-term care insurance. Also, ask the questions to the company that you're dealing with because sometimes you have a waiting period an elimination period, which is anywhere from 30 days to 90 days. You want to know that because that means that you're going to be paying out of pocket during that elimination period and then your insurance will kick in. But custodial care is not paid for by Medicare, by Blue Cross, by any of the uh, private insurance companies other than long-term care. And also, it doesn't necessarily pay for all of the services. You have to know how much your daily rate is, how much you're allowed. 
hiring a, a person to do in-home care, you want to make sure that if you're hiring from an agency, that the a you want to know that the agency basically has some requirements in how they train their staff. Are they doing Alzheimer's uh, education? Are they doing CPR? Are they doing, um, you know, classes so that the caregiver is on top of the type of service that you need? Basically, what you want to do is, is that you want to know if the agency is withholding taxes. Because the reality is, is that when you hire yourself, you truly are responsible for much of that the taxes, you're, you know, and um, you're re responsible for anything that is mandated by the government. If you're doing it yourself, you need to know that that is your responsibility. If you're doing it through an agency, make sure that the agency is not a registry that basically is just handing you caregivers but not handling all of the um, governmental requirements. Um, basically, um, you want to know what the agency is like, you know, base, do they have, um, you know, that if you're going to hire someone through an agency, that if the person doesn't show up, they're going to make sure that they get someone to be there for you. Um, if uh, you don't like the caregiver that you're using, that they will change the caregiver up. If you hire from an agency as opposed to privately, the agency should be paying workers' compensation, liability insurance. So none of those issues are on your shoulders because if someone falls in your home, you are ultimately responsible. And if you don't have a rider on your, work, on your insurance policy at home, then basically, and the person sues you that falls, then you're, you know, you're the one that is liable. When you have a caregiver that is from an agency, they need to have two 10-minute breaks and they need to have a half hour for lunch. These are things that you know are usually mandated. Now, truthfully, when you have a caregiver in your home, hopefully the situation isn't so bad that they're working every minute of the day and that they do have some downtime in caring for your loved one, but it is important for you to be aware of that. An adult day care center basically is a place where someone can go to and have activities. They have art projects, they have music projects. It allows Mr. Jones to go in there and be taken care of for a certain amount of time. It doesn't have to be every day, it could be twice a week, three times a week, depending on what you decide. They have physical activities that also gives the caregiver a respite. It gives them time for a break and they don't have to worry about having a specific caregiver in the home. Assisted living. Many times we suggest assisted living. We've taken care of Mrs. Jones, for instance, and she passes away. Mr. Jones, all of a sudden, never made any decisions for himself. He never really made the social, you know, connections. It was always Mrs. Jones. So what happens is, is that sometimes they are extremely, Mr. Jones becomes extremely isolated and depressed. And oftentimes, it is very important if they are physically able to be involved in other things, to go to an assisted living and check it out and see that it could be very, very good for socialization, for structure, for making sure that they're getting their meals. Mr. Jones probably never prepared a meal in his life and then all of a sudden his wife dies and he has no one and, and to be able to prepare a meal or he doesn't know even how to boil water. So sometimes it's very, very nice to be able to have that as a part of it. And then a lot of times people feel the communal living is much better for them because they feel like they really are isolated when they are by themselves. So that this is an option that you can think of when your loved one is um, at the stage where they need to basically make some decisions. And I'm finding that that's more with someone who is a little bit more able to be, you know, functioning and, and be a little bit more social. 
at the end of life, I think that a lot of times people have thought of hospice as, oh my God, it's like they're going to kill my loved one. But the reality is, is that hospice is really something that needs to be considered. You don't even have to do it. You can find out about it. If your loved one really has about six months or less to live, and that is what the doctor is telling you, you may want to really consider speaking to a hospice. See how they are able to assist you in going, at the, in going through this end of life chapter. What happens is, is that they have social workers, they have people that will be able to help you through the changes as the decline is happening, and they will do no heroic measures. That means that if your loved one has cancer, they, you, you have chosen that the, not to have any more chemotherapy or any heroic measures done, and that they do a lot of comfort measures. They do a lot of pain management. This is something, again, you never have to do it, but it's something that you should consider in at least approaching. Talking to a hospice should the end of life be an, it coming, you know, coming close. In conclusion, please, please make sure that you make decisions because you are trying to make the quality of your life as well as the quality of your loved one's life the best that it can be. I think that what happens is, is that people keep taking on so much responsibility on their shoulders. They're taking care of so many, peop so many people in their lives that they end up, like Bunny said, oftentimes dying before their loved ones. Please make sure that when you take care of the quality of life for your loved one, the quality of life for yourself will also be better. Um, and that's pretty much it. If you have any questions as to how things might work specifically for you as opposed to, you know, somebody else, you can always ask. Bunny and I are always available. You can, you know, take our information. Always call us for anything. We've been in the community for a very, very long time and are really able to get you to the right um, resources so that you don't feel like you are in crisis. Thank you very much. If any of you have questions, please raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. And if you want to direct it to either Bunny or, or Esty specifically, do so. Otherwise, they can just kind of toss it back and forth and jump in and answer you. So, OK. What, um, <coughs> what suggestions do you have for getting the person who needs care to participate in the process of um, looking into what assistance is available uh, before there's a crisis? Um, both my husband and my father need care. Their attitudes right now are, well, you can do it. And when we need help, we'll get help. But I would like to not be the person that calls you in a crisis you know, start lining up some things now. So I'm sure you must run into that in your business. How do you get these people involved? <laughs> you know, I, I think one of the issues in it, whether it be getting care or writing estate plans or looking at insurance or starting a 401k, it is human nature to wait for the crisis. But I think we have the advantage of knowing that these issues are coming. So you, you use this, this evening as a discussion, it, it, uh, use it as unmarked. You know, I was talking to these people and there's a lot of things that we really have to plan so it makes it much easier. You know, that old stitch in time save nine. Let's talk reasonably. It may take you be able to do it. For many families, they can do it themselves. Or they get one, they have a bunch of siblings and one of the siblings is that designated person that can open the conversation. Sometimes it takes a, a professional and neutral. Also what happens is, is that you have to be honest. And I think that, that you have to basically say, you know, that in the last few weeks I've had some concerns because I know that you want me to be the caretaker, but I don't feel that I can do it so that I can't do it all the time. I can't be the 24-7 hour, 24 /7 person. So can we sit down and talk about some possible options? Maybe we can have someone come in and talk to us about what, what's out there and then 
maybe not pick everything, but have some, some things that we are starting out with. You know, I think the, you're kind of ahead of the game that they already said you're going to be doing it. <laughs> Most families just assume that's going to happen, and that's where the problems come in. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have to keep our answer a little shorter, but there are yeah. people with questions, and we're on limited time. Bunny, you had a slide that talked about insurance, Medicare slash GAP. Yes. I just turned 65, yes. and I'm having to consider the GAP part. Yes. And I'm finding it extremely confusing. I don't, you know, I keep looking at the different GAP policies associated with Medicare, and it's just a big confusing mess to me. Uh, my mind just doesn't seem a able to organize that. Do you have any suggestions? One of the, everybody knows what a Medigap policy is? Okay. Medicare, if you're in the standard Medicare, will cover certain percentages of, of your insurance. So they tend to say $100, $100 a visit is normal and customary. So Medicare will pay $80. The gap fills that in. They, you have to, pay a co-payment at a hospital of maybe, I don't know what it is now, $750, the gap will take care of that so there's no out-of-pocket expenses. The important thing for you, rather than getting overwhelmed with all the materials, start with yourself and sort of look at, you know better than other people, do you travel abroad? Do you have uh, pre-existing conditions that you want covered immediately? If you don't have pre-existing conditions, you don't have to pay the extra money to get the the higher, they go from A to J, these programs. You don't have to get the J's in the, you know, those kind of programs. If you don't travel abroad, you don't need out of country insurance. So then if you go through and understand yourself, you know, evaluate what you need, then you go through, again, Center for Healthy, uh, Center for Healthcare Rights, um, and you can call up and get that number, has a great one sheet that goes through, it gives you A to J, it gives you every company in California that covers it, and has little checkoff lists, so you just go, I mean, what I do, what I do with these things is you look down what you want, and then, then, you, co then you cost compare and look at the ratings of the companies. So, and they change from year to year, but they, it's a real easy way, they really make it very consumer friendly, and it's a simple way to do it. Mom is 99 and extremely stubborn. She's quite, um, um, she's still able sh to take care of herself, showers and uh, dresses herself. I have to come in sometimes and help her, but she's still pretty okay. She's forgetting to eat. Uh, she's, uh, sh well, the memory is really a problem. And out of all of this, the underlying issue for me is I saw on one of the uh, slides caregiver burnout. I explode. I, I'm shocked at my anger. And then, of course, I feel extremely guilty. And we have lots and lots of great days. Uh, but her stubbornness, her unwillingness to bend, to help me help her, all of that uh, just roils in me. Help, where can I go? Is there, a, is there a group therapy for me? I need to just talk about it and get other people's, uh, it, you know, it, it would be, I think for me, a, mo a mommy and me class where I used to take my kids <laughs> And we moms would sit around and get uh, little tips. I, I need that. There are a lot of uh, support groups. And I am like the, f I, I push support groups more than anything. There are um, support, does your mom have dementia? She has a, a serious memory loss. And she's okay. continually asking me over and over and yeah. over. The Alzheimer's Association has some wonderful, wonderful support groups. And what I would suggest is to call the Alzheimer's Association and ask for their helpline and see, uh, tell them the area that you live in so that it makes it easier for you so that you're not schlepping out to somewhere that is farther away than what you want to go. And there are support groups throughout 
LA County. So it's Alzheimer's Health? Al Alzheimer's Association Helpline. And I have a, um, in, in the back over there, I have a very bright yellow paper that has a lot of the community resources. And so I will show you where uh, the telephone number is. And you can call them and see where there is a uh, support group. And it is for children of, um, of parents who are in the need of help. So I ask for, uh, I call Alzheimer's Help uh, uh, Association Helpline, and then I ask for, you said there was, yeah, it's actually the Alzheimer's, you, do you use computer or do you use telephone? Computer, telephone. Because you can go Alzheimer's Association of the Southland, just, and you will find, a laundry list of support groups. If you need, these are free by the way, there are no charge for these support groups. If your, if your needs go beyond the scope of just the support, and the support I think works for probably 90% of the people, just hearing, you have a 99 year old, you don't have a chance. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, and I'll learn from your mom to be as stubborn as she is. She's lived to be 99. I mean, there's, I kind of say the serenity that. prayer. But there are groups, and I don't know where you live, but I can help you later, of people that are, are they're professionally led for more issues than it really is. I could never say no to my, you know, if the support groups don't work, then there's another level of professionally led with more in depth. But usually the Alzheimer's, the, the hospitals all have them. Opeka right over here, Wise has them. They're all over the place. Some are specifically for children. I think you just need somewhere to vent. Yeah. True. I, yeah. I, I yeah. load on my sisters, and then I feel guilty about that. Yeah. yeah. And then I think that they think that I'm abusing her, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm no, not. No, I think that you just need to vent. And I think finding a support group is the number one thing, and then see if that helps you or if you need to go beyond that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Hmm. Best way to get to you all here. <laughs> all right. Who raised their hands? Show me the rows. Okay. Thank you. When you spoke about home health care givers, and I'm sure your agency are, are excluded, uh, what I've discovered is the daily rate that's paid through the agencies or to the agencies from the insurance company. Half of it goes to the agency, and the other half goes to the home health care giver, which means it's a very low-paying job. Is there any recommendation that you have to recruit better home health care workers when we are paying our, we have already completed our long-term care insurance payments, and we just simply can't find, you know, qualified people? You know, I think when Esty spoke and, and you look, there's a lot of questions to ask about an agency. There are many agencies out there. There are, there are some, and, and you're going to get different qualities of people depending if they're giving benefits to their caregivers, are they taking care of their caregivers. You have to understand one third of the cost that you are paying for your caregiver is in the employer, the, the taxes, the workers comp, all those kinds of things. Um, that's the reality. You, you really have to do diligence. There has to be criminal background checks on these people. There has to be reference. There are some incredibly good caregivers out there, and there are some bad ones. So they really are out there. You just have to, it can't just be that your neighbor told you about a friend and it worked for them, but there really are if you do your due diligence. And and we've ended up even with a couple of police reports that we've okay. had to well, do for people. Okay. So it's a it's side very conversation, hard but there to are find these people. Well, okay. Any, any other suggestions? <laughs> well, I call think me that afterwards it or call Esty yeah, and we'll tell you Yeah, I think that you know because we've had. I mean, our agency have has had um, caregivers that have worked on one case for like four and five years at a time. So that I mean, sometimes I I think that you do. You don't, you know, you may have some bad luck, but the reality is, is that um, I've had amazing, wonderful caregivers, and the reality is, is that if you do everything by the law, you end up, you know, the agency isn't making all of this money. It is going to a lot of the workers' comp, the liability insurance, the taxes, everything that goes with it. And what happens is, is that in order for us to be able to pay the caregiver more, we have to charge more. And I think that a lot of family members just are really at a point where they are paying as much as they want to pay too. One comment.
comment about getting the caregiver and getting not only there are bad there are going to be bad caregivers and there's a small percentage out there that are just they're there they'd rather work as a caregiver than McDonald's or they have these evil things but the reality for our model and for many of the ch children that we see before any caregiver is done and Esty spoke about it you have to assess the situation you have to know whether your mom is extroverted or introverted? Does she have dementia? Does she have behavior problems? D all the other kinds of issues, not only her skill needs, but her personality needs. So uh, we send professionals out and we match them before we send them out. So what might be great, does she need a, you know, what does she need somebody with training and transferring or mental health? Or does she need a driver and somebody that cooks French cooking. So you have to individualize it for your mom, and, it, and, it, and you can do it. There's lots of lists how to do that, or the, uh, you know, in our case, that's, that's our model of caregiving, or there's, there's private care managers that do it, but you, you really have got to invest in the front end of this thing because there are plenty of people out there with good experiences, as, you know, as Esty had said. Okay. Um, I echo very much what was said in the front row. Um, I'm that sandwich generation. I have a 12-year-old. I'm working on my teaching credential and taking care of a 76-year-old who isn't performing as well as this 99-year-old. <laughs> and stubborn doesn't begin to tell you. And the guilt, you know, because of feeling, you know, enraged about her inability to <clears throat> do what she needs to do to take care of herself. And it didn't even occur to me that their taste had changed because she's not eating, she's not drinking water, and she smokes, which is making me nuts. So I have bronchitis for the fourth time this year. So I, I feel like I'm like scratching the surface. Where do I start? When you gave that list, um, five basic needs, driving, money management, medications, eating, thirst, safety, I thought, okay, hygiene, dementia. I, I'm just, I'm sh where do I start? There's just so many things I need to get a handle really on need an and then know where to go You next. really need to look at the picture and get a plan going and then yes. decide should she be at home? Should she, should she be placed? How much does she need if she's stubborn? And believe me, the majority of the cases, people are not thrilled and say, oh goody, I get to get a stranger coming into my house to mm -hmm. help them. And so then you have to balance her need for autonomy and when I hear a 99 year old, I know what, you know, it's an uphill hill battle. And then where do you have to say no? I'm not going to let my mom fall and be dehydrated and go to the emergency hospital. At that point, that's a deal breaker. And, and she has a choice. And, you know, there are people that can help you do this or you can be tough or sometimes it's a sibling again that can say this is the deal, mom. Either you get this amount of care or will find a really nice place where you can get, and there's some real good reasons for that. But you have to, you know, the, the, and you, the biggest, and we get these calls all the time, but I find the biggest, at some point, you have to decide when it is it no longer okay. Um, and at that point, you start having to do legal things. And there are, unfortunately, what? you know, it's very rare, and it's a horrible thing, but there are, Sometimes it's so extreme and the dementia is so bad and the executive function so bad that you don't have a choice. And sometimes you walk away and say, you know what, I can't do it. So those are comedy. We're not going to answer it in, in this. But the support groups are really, a, again, as a, as a basic economical way of getting some of these questions as it's here, listening to your peers. They really are a small investment of time compared to what you can get. And again, these, these assessments like the care and the case manager do, that's what we do on a daily basis, we go out and put together a plan and then you decide. And then you work on the fine tuning of, you know, it's great to have this plan and then you have plan B and C and D. And Also, you have to sit down and really kind of think for yourself or if your family is involved with it, say, see what it is that you can do and what it is that you no longer can do and really present this. Because the reality is, is that I think that what happens is, is that because you're so feeling guilty, you're feeling guilty, what happens is, is that you end up doing much more than what you're really physically and emotionally able to give. And so you have to be very clear on what you're able to do within your, within your um, time, because you're going to school, you're doing a lot of things within your ability because you have children that you have to be also involved with. So if you're more realistic about what you're able to give, then you're able to see what it is that you need to do to move forward. 
and it's a little bit clearer. Okay, any other questions? We, we're going to wrap this one up very, so you can. One very quick question. Yes. Um, my father is 95, sharp as a tack, but has macular degeneration and he's hard of hearing, but we walk every day. And I, I really do think this is a female thing of control in the house because my mother had Alzheimer and she was somewhat like what the ladies described, but my father is agreeable to everything. So I think men are just much easier. But um, dad is fabulous, but is, and even though I'm a Bruin, either one of you could answer. Uh, <laughs> um, my father has an internist but would you recommend uh, us getting a geriatric doctor? We went to a uh, Mr. James Davis at UCLA one time, and my father says, well, why would I have a doc geriatric doctor? I'm only 95, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm in great shape. What's wrong with me? But um, you know, what, do you, what do you think about two doctors? I think doctors? the long-term relationships with your internal medicine doctor, if your dad trusts them, are priceless, and I would never give that up. If there's some question. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm saying about yeah. having both. Um, if it sounds like a lot of your needs are functional, so, um, and it may be looking more at quality of life at this place. If there's physical issues, sure. But I don't, it, in your case, you're not telling me all these physical symptoms that somebody has to put together. So it may be, you know, places like Center for Partially Sighted that can come and do an assessment to. I've taken to, Okay. I, it sounds like that. you've done a lot. Yeah, and then looking at that. quality of life things that, that he can do. And, and somehow these guys that pass 95, they're, they have, you know, we should all have those genes. And, and you know, the, the body gets weaker. And I, I, you worry about what you have to worry about. And his is not getting depressed by being so isolated because you can't see and hear. And I would try well, to no, figure out. My brother lives uh, with him, and wow. I visit him every day, and I live three wow. blocks away. So He's a lucky guy. <laughs> He's a but lucky guy. You know, and, and not worry so much. I think you have to worry about the things worth worrying about. And the other things that, if he has a doctor, if he's going to the doctor, there's no acuity, he's not ending up in the hospital all the time, then at a certain point, I think you, we don't have to be running to doctors all the time either. You know, I threw up a, a bunch of resources up there, but they're not so everyone uses all of them. I mean, I really think you have to balance these things. And, okay. and I, you take lessons from these people. I don't know what your mom 99 is doing, but I wouldn't mess with her diet and I wouldn't mess with her temperament and you know, I, you know that kind of thing. But it really, um, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. People have lived, you know, he's lived nine and a half decades like this. So if he wants to go, terrific. He was neurotic and all this and he, he likes going to doctors, then do it. If not, I wouldn't push okay. it if it was my dad. Okay, thank you. Okay. Esty, Bunny, thank you so much for all your expertise and knowledge. The program was recorded at the Santa Monica Public Library and is brought to you in collaboration between the library, the Friends of the Library, City TV, and the California State Library. That's a wrap on another episode of Cool People, Places, and Things here on the West Side. For City TV, this is Lee Ehrenberg. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Great job, Lee. Is that a cut? We got it? Okay, got guys. All right, thanks. See ya. Hey, where are you going? I got some personal business to take care of. Uh, come on, guys. Stop rolling, okay? I agreed to do a reality show about hot spots in Santa Monica, but I can't let you follow me to my living room. Lee, it's a library. What's the big secret? The big secret is that at Santa Monica Public Library, what you see is not just what's on the shelves. 
All right. It's against my better judgment, but let's, as they say here at the old Biblioteca, let's check it out. Wow. I told you. This place is incredible. Isn't it? Yeah, it's got a super high green rating. It's Wi-Fi throughout. So the space actually feels alive, like a living room. Hey, Lee! Hey, what's going on, guys? How Back are you? again. Yeah, I'm always here, dude, huh? Oh, did you get our tweet? Yeah, is it 3 o'clock? Mm -hmm. 3 o'clock in the auditorium. All right, dude, I'm going to see you there, OK? All right. Later, okay. later, Bye. bye. <laughs> Friends of yours? No, those are librarians. No way. Yeah, they're all super cool. I even friended them on Facebook, and I follow them on Twitter. That's how I know one of my favorite authors is speaking at 3 o'clock today in the auditorium. Hey, you want to grab a coffee and check it out? Coffee? Right this way, Miss First Time at the Library. Oh. It's a good latte, right? That's my line. Can I at least uh, have two oh. words? I'm sorry, what, are you criticizing the writer? No, but I don't I mean, think you You're lucky paragraph. to be in this if you weren't good looking. Seriously. <laughs> Heather. We put a lid on these. We can go inside. We can check out the latest CDs, DVDs, bestsellers. Yeah. Cool. That's great for you, but I don't live here. I live in the South Bay. Do you got a California driver's license or a photo ID? That's it. That's all you need for a library card. I'm out of here. What? Where are you going? Get my library card. Dwayne, let's go. Are you going too? Ah, oh, great. There goes the neighborhood. Hey, guys, welcome to the It's Cool to Be Smart Club. Why don't you join the happening at Santa Monica Public Library? where the brains meet the beach at 6th and Santa Monica. Check us out today.